how much scaffolding they had to put up. And I, I was like, do you think that? You think they built that back then? Look at the scaffolding just to repair it today. And the immensity of the scaffolding was anything that you could see with a 20 or 30 floored building. And we're like, no, nah, they didn't. They didn't build that. They repaired it. And that was the whole story. The running theme of everything is they just kept walking in and finding finding previous settlements that were abandoned. Like, here's a good one for you. You know, Palmanova, the one Starfort city that I sent you a bunch of images about. I'm trying to bring that up right now. That was an abandoned city. Welcome back to Raised by Giants and welcome everyone in the chat, moderators and members out there. Thank you very much for tuning in, even though it's a little later of a show than we normally do, but it's worth it uh, doing it later this evening because we have with us tonight the creator of Adapt 2030 channel on YouTube discussing energetic changes on Earth as the sun repeats its 400 year cycle of low activity affecting global crop production the economy, and everyone on our planet with a timeline of what you can expect from now to 2030 as society resets. A warm welcome back to the show, David Dubine. Thanks so much for coming on, brother. How are you doing? Doing well. It's been a busy uh, three and a half weeks trying to dive into history through Croatia and then up into Italy and then back over here to Taiwan with a different set of eyes specifically looking for the event and trying to tie in timelines, rewritten history, the, the historical records of why some places were abandoned. And with the archaeologists that I'd spoken to, it seems that you can f definitively find these time periods, but they're not exactly sure from one destructive phase to another exactly which decade it occurred, but it's it's in the record everywhere now that you look from the oil paintings to the lithographs to the stone carvings. It doesn't matter the historical accounts, the nautical museum and the port records, and everywhere you look, it seems that it's detached, but the dots are enough out there that if you start to look for them you can find certain groupings of these dots that point to different timelines. And uh, that's what the whole last three and a half weeks was about from Croatia into Italy. I was trying to at least scrape together enough information about the event coming this year in October of 2024, about what would happen if the tides were two to three to possibly five times higher for just a week before and a week after coming into October 23rd of 2024 this year. How would that disrupt our society? So that was my whole journey. And uh, that's why Ryder and myself are sitting here today talking. I wanted to discuss a little bit of it and some of my findings. Well, we're rapidly approaching that 2030 mark uh, here in a few years. You're going to have to change that bio, Dave. Uh, you know, what, what, what does happen when we hit 2030? I mean, your channel is Adapt 2030. What happens when it is 2030, if all of this is still around and things haven't gone completely and utterly into catastrophe, because there's always a possibility, right, that everything turns out fine. This is the story of the worst road trip ever. In April of 1846, a man named James Fraser Reed, an Illinois businessman, eager to build a greater fortune in the rich land of California, leads nine covered wagons out of Springfield, Illinois, on the 2,500-mile journey to California, in what would become one of the greatest tragedies in the history of westward migration. 
Reed found others seeking to find fortune, adventure, and new beginnings on this perilous trek across the West. Among them was the Donner family. Others like the Graves, Breens, Murphys, Eddies, McCutcheons, Kessebergs, and the Wolfingers would come too. The successful Reed was determined his family would not suffer on the long journey, as his wagon was an extravagant two-story with a built-in iron stove, spring-cushioned seats, and bunks for sleeping, and two hired servants to help with the workload. Reed's 12-year-old Virginia dubbed it the Pioneer Palace Car. Also in the group were the families of George and Jacob Donner. George Donner was a successful 62-year-old farmer who had migrated five times before settling in Springfield, Illinois, along with his brother Jacob. Obviously adventurous, the brothers decided to make one last trip to California. At the bottom of Jacob Donner's saddlebag was a copy of Lansford Hastings's Emigrant's Guide, with its tantalizing talk of a faster route to the Garden of the Earth. It's tough, but the going's good, Tamsin Donner writes in her journal. I could never have believed we could have traveled so far with so little difficulty. Indeed, if we do not experience anything worse, I shall say the trouble is all in getting started, but as leader of the wagon train, Tamsin's husband George Donner is aware there's one final obstacle to their journey, the Sierra Nevada, with peaks up to 14,000 feet. It's known if you fail to clear the mountain passes before the first snow falls, the repercussions and results can be both horrifying and deadly. As the Donner Party approaches Utah, George Donner makes a pivotal flaw in his decision to splinter off from the main party. Hastings' cutoff says it's a fine level road with plenty of water and grass, saving 400 miles. As it turns out, Donner's information is wrong. In fact, the so-called shortcut adds at least 100 miles to the journey. High in the Sierra Nevada, the Donner Party enters the Truckee Pass. They're only 30 miles from the California Plains, but supplies are dangerously low, and traveling through the mountains is taking its toll ending in a broken axle. The Donner Party stops to make repairs, but that night, five feet of snow falls. Soon the drifts are 60 feet deep. The Donner Party will be stranded for five months. In just three weeks, they've eaten all their food. Then they kill their pack animals. Next, they eat charred bones, twigs, bark, leaves, and dirt. Finally, a suggestion was made that were one to die, the rest might live. Cannibalism. On Christmas Day, 1846, a Christmas feast, like few others, takes place. They devour their first human. Bodies are cut up, flesh labeled so people don't eat their own kin. Later, four rescue parties bring out some survivors. The very last finds a man named Ludwig alone. Around him, a scene that haunts us today and will continue to leave a lasting mark in history. Ludwig is surrounded by bones and entrails, a two-gallon kettle filled to the brim with human blood. Also nearby is George Donner's body, his skull split open, his brain removed. Tamsin Donner's body is never found. It also seems a man named William Foster shot two Miwok Native American guides named Lewis and Salvador for food, which is the only instance of anyone in the Donner-Reed party that was murdered and eaten. The rest of the cannibalized were already dead. They took the survivors to Sutter's Fort, California, by the route that is now known as Donner Pass. Stranded in the early snows of the Sierra Nevada mountains, nearly half the travelers died of starvation and illness. Even today, Interstate 80 has to be closed occasionally due to heavy snows and blizzards. Only 45 of the original 81 members of the Donner Party survived. This truly was the worst road trip ever. Which reminds us not to be complacent, but instead be proactive with our prepping. We don't have to worry about not having food to last. We have my Patriot Supply. And right now, you can save $200 on a three-month food kit with Adapt 2030. Adapt and stay prepared. And now on with the video. I don't know. There maybe I'm just wishful thinking or, or hopeful thinking there. But there's always that possibility. There is. And I'm just going to quit the channel and say I totally had gotten it wrong. So I don't even believe my own reality anymore at that point. And I'll have to probably check myself into some sanatorium to try to... <laughs> to, to re, revamp my mind into whatever I built for myself as awakened reality is definitely distorted. 
But if you do look out at it, it seems that the elitists are getting us to do exactly that, build the reality for them. And these last set of economic meetings here with the WEF, they're very clean on their playbook moving out. It's going to be a very rapid fashion in the way that your arm's going to be twisted or society's arms are going to be twisted. But you can already see the uh, amount of pushback is, is causing them some duress already that not everybody's going to go quietly into the night. So is it built around us and our compliance and our building their reality for them? But now there seems to be like, you know, a a call, you know, a wrench dropped into the jet engine there because it doesn't seem that their plans are going smoothly. So will they move to all out brute force? But generally through history, what you realize is all out brute force just never works because as soon it's easy to do a soft invisible prison. But once you go to the brute force mechanism because you've run out of options, uh, people quickly awake. And it seems that then there's, you know, 10 times more pushback than the, uh, the soft illusionary route. For control. I mean, here's what I'm saying. Okay, so nothing is really built to last, not even our society, right? I mean, you buy something, it breaks very quickly, and you have to buy a new one. I mean, that's consumerism 101. If people want to know more about that, they should look into the light bulb conspiracy. There's a fantastic documentary made on that in 2010. But anyway, my point is that the only things that seem to last are appliances and tools from decades ago, right? Those refrigerators from the 60s and 70s are going to outlast us all, Dave, right? <laughs> so now if you, let's say now you walk into an antique store today, all of that stuff still works. It's all very usable because it's mostly manual things like cranks and presses and they're all built very well. Now, here's what I'm getting at. If you were to, let's just say, let's fast forward 100 years into the future. Let's say that me and you, Dave, or anyone that's listening to this just hops in a time machine and travels 100 years into the future. What do you think would be in those antique stores? The same stuff that's in it to this very day or the stuff that's being made today? Depends what type of quality of things you purchase today, because me personally, I do two routes at this juncture. I either buy a high quality Japanese made like hand saw for, you know, things that I, you know, I have the farm or I go to estate sales and I get the antiques from estate sales or you can spend the money, which costs quite a bit more to get something of durable quality today. But the, the world we live in today is not made for buying a lot of high quality things because it's so absurdly expensive compared to, you know, if you go into tractor supply or some kind of, I don't know, there's probably those stores near you. Everything's made in China. Uh, the, the tools are made to get like one or two projects done just around the house. Then, you know, it's going to break versus getting something that has a, like a lifetime guarantee on like a craftsman wrench set or some sort of, you know, uh, uh, ratchet sets or something like this that's going to be incredibly durable where you get lifetime warranties with it but then you're going to pay three or five times more than just the junk coming out so there's two options now and what i think would be in the future would be the copper pipes that are still here from right now yes you know one thing that's surprising is the amount of copper piping that i saw in europe still you know, going in, we stayed in a fair few nice Airbnbs because being off season and shoulder season, you know, you get everything at a third of the price right now. But it's, it's a little chillier. Uh, you know, everything's not green and vegetative and pretty with all the flowers and the balconies and everything. But it's still pretty rad because you're in old Europe and old, I mean, incredibly old uh, Croatia. But I noticed the copper piping was everywhere. And again, you know, the benefits of copper piping mm. throughout time immemorial, those durables will still be around. The things that we might make today in terms of durability, like that craftsman set that's going to cost you five times more or some kind of tough tools, those will still be here. 
but out, as a general rule, I can't say maybe 5% of the stuff that's currently made today versus 95% of the stuff that was made 50 years ago. I mean, I'm looking around it. So I'm sitting in a kitchen slash office here and I'm looking at the durability of things going, Hmm, none of the light bulbs will work because they're all meant to burn out after a certain time. <laughs> and this whole thing, and I'm going to say another thing kind of on, on that goes with this. Everything in Europe has switched to LED lighting 100%. But the thing was, when I would get ready to line up photos that I had that blink, 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 every time we were taking photos. So the forcing of us to go away from regular bulbs, not the curly Q CFL bulbs, but just what you would consider a regular incandescent bulb very soft, very pleasing, very uh, soothing when you have that light in your home, like a Tesla bulb that you see in coffee shops where you can see the lines coming out, you can turn it up or down very much like the sun. When you turn up the electrical frequency or charge in flow into the sun, it glows brighter just like it does with these uh, light bulbs I'm looking at here in a coffee shop where you can then turn it down or up. That's a Berkeley current turning up the frequency and the elect, you know, the electrical conductivity, electromagnetism of the sun, or you turn it down and it dims and invisibly noticeable. But that is one thing that really freaked me out was the blinking of the LEDs that was really visible anytime I held up my phone camera, not so much visible in my SLR camera when I was shooting further afield, when I have a telephoto lens, when I was like looking up, at the steeple tops or, you know, some kind of ether harvesting, uh, you know, domes and balls on top of cathedrals and things. Not visible then, but the phone picked up all the blinking LEDs. So those things are meant to break at a certain number of hours too. Like I can't even see our light bulbs. You know, I go to estate sales, I'll get light bulbs from like the 1950s that still screw into the socket. You know, it's crazy. Even in the 1950s, there were preppers everywhere. They'd buy like a thousand light bulbs and you go in and you can get a hundred <laughs> light bulbs in a box still that totally work of just like soft white light from, from GE. And those are still around, but none of these LEDs will be around, nothing. But that that really, the, the disruption in the sleep patterns too is what I noticed because I only have a couple LEDs in my house, but over there in Europe, 100% is. So everywhere you go, every room you turn on, every where you try to even the night lights that you know you turn on before you, you're getting ready to go to bed they're all blinking the whole time and uh, it's just really a disruptive light frequency zone around in europe right now so i was trying to go somewhere with the point with that of something not being left but bricks probably will be left you know maybe some stone something like that but nothing else we have a Maybe that's the reason that when we approach 2030, that whoever started manufacturing at that time and, and doing this understood that we were at the end of the age and that it would be not worth the time, effort, money, capital input to allow people to keep anything because it was all going to break anyway. So give them, you know, less quality products. Yeah, and it's interesting too that you bring up this copper piping as well, because you know copper is the most one of the most uh, conductive uh, elements that we have uh, on the earth, and it's interesting that it's all PVC pipe now, and they made people switch to PVC pipe, and that makes you question like why, why did they do that? You know, and PVC pipe is made out of plastics. All the plastics that are in our food, uh, plastics that is in our water, you know, it's uh, it's disrupting our body. But I really think that, and this is going to lead into your research that you're doing uh, at the moment. I really don't think people understand how finite our society is, right? Literally. Everything can be gone in the matter of minutes. One flip of the switch, the internet goes down, we're screwed. We're literally screwed. Everything has been digitized. Documents, records, money, banks, books, grocery stores, post office, you know? And I understand why they did that. It's for efficiency and, and getting things done quicker. But the problem comes in when you've built your entire system on top of that right? You know, nothing, nothing is going to last. If the internet goes down, 
This generation literally has nothing. And the people that think that they're making a difference on the internet, well, they aren't if they can just be erased, right? And in a hundred years in the future, no one would even know that we existed. And that is a very high possibility. I mean, think about it. What has the last 23 years been about? It's been about the internet. It's how everyone communicates. It's how people get their voice out there through social media. You create content. That's what this show is. That's what your show is. And that's what a lot of people's lives revolve around is the internet. Take that away. We got nothing. And I guarantee in a hundred years, if everything, if the internet was to go down, everything was it just gets wiped in a hundred years, it'll be like we didn't even exist. And you look at the quality of home building today too. These homes are not built for a hundred years of durability you know, homes that were built in the 1950s, yeah. But you look at today's just prefab construction, slap up a bunch of homes with like two feet between each other with the yards with their low maintenance and you have your fee and somebody else mows your yard for you. Like those kind of buildings will fall down in, you know, 40 years. Because I'd seen the most interesting documentary about what would happen after a nuclear war. And not the point, the nuclear war point, but what it was talking about after humanity quit inhabiting cities uh, within 300 years, there would be nothing left except the most girthy of what you consider like superstructures holding up eight lane highways and foundations of buildings. Even the aluminum would have corroded, the glass would have shattered. And after a thousand years, there's absolutely zero, zero trace of humanity. What would you be finding a quote, quote unquote megalith would would just be like that, an eight lane highway, you know, concrete superstructure that was holding it up. We'd look at it and go, there's no carvings or no markings. We don't know when the era was, but we know it was big. Look at the substrate that they poured into this thing. And that's kind of where, you know, the archaeologists would be be at. You know, they'd probably be trying to compare us, our concrete with Roman concrete. And be like, why was the Roman concrete so much more durable? We're looking at something from 3,000 years ago. You know, you're a thousand years in the future, so you're looking at something 3,000 years prior, which is much higher quality on the uh, on the durability than this new substrate stuff. What happened? They de-evolved in society. So even concrete, our current concrete, is not even made to last. Think about the Roman concrete. I, you know, I went around a couple of Colosseums, and here's a real interesting one for you. There's a city called Verona, V-E-R-O-N-A, and they have a full coliseum in there. It's, it used to seat 30,000 people. The thing is, it's smaller than the original one, which is another full floor taller or another archway, you know, much taller. And the base of it is at least double the, the, the width of the base of the stones. So what was told to me was, they could not replicate the technology in the Roman era to build what they had found as their own cultural layer previously. So you got to realize the ancient Romans, when they went cruising around, they were finding different layers beneath them as well that they were in, re-inhabiting or refinding. But some of the stuff was so big, like part of a Colosseum, we always attribute the Romans, the Roman Colosseum. Well, that's small stuff in comparison. In Rome, they had to dig their Colosseum out. Like if you find a lot of the older photos, I encourage you to look at Rome uh, and go into ancient Rome uh, image gallery, say 1850, 1880 or something. And you'll find a whole bunch of images of Rome where they're actually digging the mud out from around the Colosseum. Like it is nowhere remotely flat. What we see in today's images where there's little Vespas cruising around it was mud 20 feet deep up through that thing. And then they were digging out a huge, huge amount of Rome, as we understand it was covered in 20 feet of mud. And then we're up in Verona also. For them, the ancient Romans, quote unquote, that had the best technology, best concrete, best engineering, best aqueducts, best everything. They could not replicate the previous society before them of building on the girth and the size they were just like, well, this is way out of our, this is the complexity is too big. The stones are too big. It's way outside of our, you know, our realms of being able, we'll, we'll just make it smaller, but same, same, but different. 
And, you know, the old ones stand. There's one part of the wall on the old one that stands outside the new one. And it's just mind blowing to look at the size of the old one. Like mm, that's a previous reset society that built that first one. We Romans replicated the second ones. And, uh, you know, one point to that is another thing that was noticeable. Because once you go and you start cruising around the museums, you're going to come into a lot of statues that were damaged. And I was asking the curator there, I was like, you know, I know they did a lot of purposeful damage to these statues. Like, what was it? Why, why did they go on? You know, Christian era begins, Pisces begins. You know, they moved out of Aries. They moved into Pisces with the birth of Christ, the fish. Before it was Aries, the ram, the lamb. And prior to that, it was Taurus, the bull. So there's a lot of bull iconography everywhere. But the one thing, moving from Aries into Pisces, uh, I was like, why were the Christians so destructive on everything? And he's like, I don't know. It seems like they were trying to just break away the entire old world because it was a new world. So they were trying to destroy everything of the old world. And my light bulb came on. I'm like, that's exactly right. Because we just moved out of Pisces into Aquarius. And then look what's happening in just five years of the destruction of the old world. So it seems like when we enter into a new age, the old age is destroyed on purpose whether it be stone or whether it be digital or whether it be what paper mache, I don't care. They destroy everything of the vestige of the old world to usher in the new world, the new energy and all things from the old time for a better term are destroyed because they want you to know that you're in a new era because those statues all had the same damage to them. They ripped off the noses. And before, if you didn't know this, like any kind of large marble statues that would have been from Greece or Rome had crystals in the eyes, whether it would have been uh, sapphires and some of the more you know ornate kind of what you consider emperor type uh, you know, palace things or to regular what you consider just like crystals of, you know, white crystals. But each set of statues had eyes that literally glowed from crystals being inserted in the eyes and they would rip off the noses, gouge out the eyes, rip off the head, cut off the hands, chip as much as they could off of the clothing that would be, you know, look like a wavy clothing off that and then uh, just throw it off to the side. It took them several centuries to do that, but they definitely had removed or tried to destroy and remove vestiges that of the old world as we moved into Pisces. And it wasn't like, Christian era and the Christian, you know, what you consider, you, you know, you can attest better than me around 300 AD or so is when Christianity really solidified itself. So between that zero mark era all the way until 300 AD, Christianity wasn't fully where you understand it is today with the church and all this thing. But for those 300 years, it was just a destruction fest. And when I look now from Pisces into Aquarius, we just moved in there December of 2020 Oh, man, there's been a lot of damage so far to our society in just five years, but it's all digital. So it's going to be way easier to destroy than a bunch of stone with crystal eyes. Yes, I think that that is the real conspiracy. They make things not durable. They make things not to last. They turn everything digital. And all of my work has been done on the Internet, right? My channel, my podcast, my documentary, JFKX on Amazon Prime, by the way, it's all on the internet and it can be taken away very easily. If by some chance the internet gets wiped, there wouldn't be any physical evidence to prove any of the work that we've done, right? Now, people would say, oh, well, make sure everything is backed up onto a hard drive. And I do that, right? But here's the thing, Dave, that I don't think people are really thinking about. Who's to say that in the future, people will even be able to use a USB drive or a Type-C connector? We've seen how fast our technology has went. It used to be floppy disk to store your information on. And now no one has a floppy disk drive. Floppy disk drives are completely obsolete. So why do we believe that in the future, USB drives won't be obsolete? So that means even if someone finds your hard drive in the future, 
they aren't even going to be able to figure out a way to use it or getting the information off of it, which I think is the case for a lot of these lost civilizations. My theory is that they were using a technology that we have absolutely no idea about or how to figure it out because it was so different than ours. So even if we were to find something, let's say from a couple of thousand or however long you think the last advanced civilization was, even if we have something that resembles what we have now, can we figure out how to use it? Which then really makes me think about, I don't want to change, really change the topic uh, here at all. I want to keep on this topic, but it makes me think about like these, these UFOs, right? And the, the technology that we've supposedly reverse engineered from extraterrestrials and these people talking about a, a crash retrieval, right? I think the crash retrieval narrative is a, a giant misnomer. I don't think that the crash retrieval means that anybody witnessed something falling out of the sky or uh, they saw it on radar. So then they immediately went to it to retrieve it and get the technology to try and reverse engineer it. Crash retrieval. All right. I, I guess I'll, um, I'll give you an example. Let's say that me and you, Dave, I'm giving a lot of examples, but uh, me and you, Dave, we went to Afghanistan, right? We decided to do an archaeological dig, right? We do the archaeological dig. We find some sort of craft. We find something that we have absolutely no idea about. That would be considered a crash retrieval. The crash retrieval doesn't depict an amount of time that has been here. So I think when people are, you know, talking about these crash retrieval stuff, it's not what it actually seems like that it is. I think that a lot of the stuff we have just dug up and we have found from ancient civilizations. And that's one of the interesting things that Bob Lazar talked about as well. I don't, I don't believe Bob Lazar's story, but I, uh, I, it's a possibility that he was shown some things and he said that he was under the impression that at least one of them were dug up, which then brings into a whole other line of thought. But back to um, people thinking that the technology that we have now is still going to be a valuable thing in the future. I don't think that it is. A USB drive that we have now is not going to be able to, it's not going to be still the same thing in two to 300 years in the future. I remember floppy disks. I remember my first floppy disk was 64 K 64 K. That was big. You were able to put a couple documents on it, you know, like before you'd have to walk around with two huge thick books like this thick, like, you know, how much those would weigh five, eight pounds. Or you could carry it around this little floppy thing. Now, remember, we're only talking about what you consider today like Microsoft Word documents. You know, and even then it wasn't MS Word. That took too much. It was more just like a notepad. So, yeah, those readers are gone. I mean, some people collect that kind of stuff, like Atari games and floppy disk readers. But, I mean, there's probably only one in a million people who still have one of those that can access that technology. Because... Like your crash retrieval, for an example, of finding advanced, either harvesting equipment that is still visible in what well, you can say, like cathedrals and churches and spires and this sort of thing. It just, it, for me, the equivalent of finding an old engine block in the middle of the forest somewhere. The wheels are gone. There's no frame on the car. It's just you found an engine block. That's been stripped. There's no valves, nothing. You just found an engine block and, you know, it was significant to do something to drive. It was, there was another purpose for it and you knew it was to create power to do something. And that's kind of where we sit with this whole ether harvesting, Tartaria technology, 
because what, one thing I did see in the cathedrals that I noticed in uh, not everywhere, a couple places, and then also had was in being actively stripped out of Croatia in a place called Shibenik was there's just copper, you know, copper, it's probably about two to three inches thick running down the floors and then up each of the, uh, so let's say it's an eight sided uh, dome cathedral that you're going into like the, the copper, a good two to three inches wide. I don't know. I couldn't see the thickness of it, but it was running up and then up to the center and then up into wherever the spire was that was coming down. I've seen it at a couple of places where it was still very visible in Italy and they didn't take it out of the flooring or up on the sides of the walls going up to the top of the, you know, the top of the dome and the cathedrals there. But in Shibenik, they were actually chipping it out of the wall. Like you could see where the whole chipping mark had gone up or somebody had come in with like brute force to chip it and rip it out. But before they had a chance to you know, like smooth it back over. And this was in uh, where was this? this is in split. But they had ripped it out of the wall, but they hadn't refaced the wall. So they left the gouge marks, were, which were like, you know, a good six, eight inches wide, something like that, at that V where you could see they were getting down into it. So it makes me question, was it a square of copper that was running or was it a V? Because the chip out marks all were Vs going up all the different sides of this one uh, cathedral that we went into. And then it was also being refaced from the outside, but the amount of like scaffolding and stuff was just mind blowing how much scaffolding they had to put up. And I, I was like, do you think that you think they built that back then? Look at the scaffolding just to repair it today. And the immensity of the scaffolding was anything that you could see with a 20 or 30 floored building. And we're like, no, nah, they didn't, they didn't build that. They repaired it. And that was the whole story. The running theme of everything is they just kept walking in and finding, finding previous settlements that were abandoned. Like, here's a good one for you. You know, Palmanova, the one Starfort city that I sent you a bunch of images about. I'm trying to bring that up right now. That was an abandoned city. The people in the, the protectorate of Venice at the time was actually paying people to come up to live there. Now, here's the story. This Starfort city is built in, the, it starts construction in 1598. They finished raising this uh, city 50 foot into the air from a flat plain. It's 2.9 miles around just on the edge of the walls, 30 feet tall. So I did some rough calculations because I brought a ruler with me. So I measured the bricks when I was out there. So they needed roughly 750 million bricks. And they were supposed to bring this in bricks manufactured elsewhere, transported in there and using, let's say, a billion bricks. We'll keep it at even billion. And they built that entire city in 30 years. But then on the outside of the brick layering, they had uh, facing stones that were cut at a perfect 45 degree angle, and they needed about 75 million of those. So we're supposed to believe the historical record is they came in and it was a flat plane. Like a, a, think about going into like uh, Kansas, completely flat. And they said, you know what? That's not going to be good enough. That's not going to yeah. be good enough. Let's just raise. 50 feet into the air and we'll fill it in with earth, but it's actually a, a substrate that I have some pictures of behind the walls that were broken apart in one single area that people are leaving clues. You know, they always have to leave you the truth. So if you look deep enough, you're going to find the truth somewhere in the site. So they raised this whole city up 50 feet, 2.9 miles around on the inner city. What you're, what you're looking at is the full construction of supposedly that furthest outer ring there was constructed by Napoleon in the 1800s. So it went through three different constructive eras. The first era went from like 1598 to, uh, you know, 1630 or so. And that's interesting because that was the beginning of the Maunder Minimum and everything ceased for 120, 130 years. But within that first 30 years, they were able to move a billion bricks, build wall 2.9 miles around, 30 feet tall, put facing stones on it, and then upraise and lift the city full 50 feet and, and do that entire earthwork 50 feet deep. So we're talking about cubic miles of earth moving. And then I asked the curator, I said, well, where, where'd y'all get the bricks from? Because I'm looking at a lot of bricks out here on the wall. You know, I walked around, there's a huge amount of bricks and it was so how proud and heavy. Oh, look at the construction we did. I said, well, by my estimation, because I measured some of the bricks, you needed almost a billion bricks. You needed 1.5 billion bricks just on the outer surface. You need 750 million bricks. 
where did you get all the bricks from? Because I don't see any brick kilns or oh, we brought them up from all these places. So she named like three or four places. And I was like, well, what's the average amount of bricks that you could put on a wagon at that time in the 1600s? Like, what's the weight on the, you know, you couldn't put a ton on a wagon at that time. <laughs> I mean, you would need multiple bulls or multiple horses in the, you know, the, the energy in for the energy out. E-R-O-E-I is, is we're going to be just blown off the charts trying to move a literal ton of something. And then, I, I, you know, I was like, well, how many broken wagon wheels are there laying around? Because I would expect to see tens of thousands of broken wagon wheels. If you're going to be moving that much weight all over the place, like you should have like a, a Himalayan size you know, mountain of broken wagon wheels laying around, especially when you went to do the unloading and something tilted off to the side and broke both hubs or spokes. I mean, I should see like a uh, hundred thousands broken spokes somewhere. There are millions of broken spokes. If there's that much moving of brick going on. So just the, the sheer amount of volume. And then I, I did a calculation by using some rough online stuff here uh, to get the calculation of 3,000 cubic meters of uh, yeah, something that, you know, what concrete for a better term to be able to put the bricks together. You know, so we're talking about cubic, three foot by three foot by three foot, one cubic meter. You need 3,000 cubic meters just for the, uh, for the concrete mix in between that. I'm like, you know, just dump trucks that we do today, that would take thousands of those dump trucks of what we do today. Like who, who's mixing that? Where was the mixing facility? Where's your lime pits? Like, how did they mix all that? This place is so pristine. There's like really nothing left of the construction era. So the reason I'm telling you all this is after all the construction was done, you think it would be like the most massive commerce ridden, you know, just epicenter of business because you need that much material that much goods coming back and forth you need that much you know feed to be brought in for all the horses and bulls and you need all the food for all the workers and the housing and this and that and that and then by 1640 they can't get anybody to live there so in venice they were asking and giving prisoners free homes that were pre-built up in this city to go live up there because they couldn't get anybody to live there now, you know, the stories are just so like fanciful. And then some people I talked to that actually live in the city uh, were like, no, they, they, the Romans found this and they just kind of walked into it. It was already built. Well, that's the theory with a lot of the these structures is no one really knows where they came from, how they were there. When you ask the historians, they'll be like, well, previous people just came in and the, it was already here. This other photo that you sent me, I think, is really interesting because this looks like it was uh, like they're trying to build like a a fortress. Like, and I don't think that these things around it are like mountains. I think that they're actual structures that somebody built. And if you hit the uh, share thing, it'll pop up on my end. And I'll, well, I'll just go through your slides. I can explain this one easily. Now, this yeah. is in the Nautical Museum. And, uh, you know, you read the reviews online about going into the Venice Nautical Museum. They're like, oh, that's a dusty old thing. They haven't curated this thing. And damn, the thing's from like the 1980s. They haven't updated anything. And I'm like, that's, the, <laughs> that's where I'm going because they didn't hide anything yet. <laughs> So there's this series of probably 20 of these. And what it is, it's what the Italian Navy and the Italian military controlled as bastions along the coast. And there's, it's a 3D. It's actually 3D. It's on the wall. It pops out. They did a 3D modeling of it. So from 1692, this is uh, Isola Siate Forteza di Corfu. And, and they'll show you, I know, I mean, in a, the year of 1692. So they go through all the physical ports that they owned uh, and controlled during that time. And they're all star forts, every single one of them. And you look at the size of this thing. That, that's like two kilometers long or, you know, a little over a mile point two across that peninsula there. So you can go and find these same areas today. And I encourage you to do the matchups because... Mainly, they stripped away a lot of the star fort and they turned them into these new, quote unquote, shipping container ports. Now, they use the base of it, of course, because it's already built. What they do strip out is the actual uh, formations of it. But that was a, a terraformed land there. 
And then offshore, also that island that's been terraformed a little bit. But I have a, a dozen of these images here. But I thought this was a real good one to, to show you that even back in the late 1600s, you know, you're looking at how long would this take to construct first? And it looks like it's been there for quite some time because the city is built and nestled within that. So, you know, the time era of this fortification being built is not, in my opinion, the same time era that the city that exists within there was built. The fortifications were first. Those who came after found it and it was abandoned. And then they started to build in what we consider that, you know, haphazard, non-grid laid out just city because they found what they found. Okay, hey man, this place is a little better repaired than the rest. Why don't we start living here first and we'll kind of work through it as we move through the decades here? Because that seemed to be the running theme is this previous builder society one step back. And I would say that collapse of this builder society was 3,500 years ago. Just under 1,500 years ago, something terrifying happened to the world's climate, something nobody could understand. The sun began to go dark. Rain, the color of blood, poured from the skies. Clouds of fine dust enveloped the earth. Winter gripped the land for two years. Then came drought, famine, plague, and death. Whole cities were wiped out. Civilizations crumbled and nobody knew what had happened. It was a catastrophe. A catastrophe that affected millions and millions of people all around the world. But what was it? a catastrophic climatic event buried in the heart of the Dark Ages. This mid-6th century catastrophe was the most important date in the history of the past 2,000 years. This event created the world we live in today, something far removed from the minds of everyday peoples of our modern times, unbeknownst to most, the catastrophe could at any time happen again. The volcanic winter was caused by at least three simultaneous eruptions of uncertain origin, with several possible locations proposed in various continents. There is even evidence of an extraterrestrial factor. A possible origin for this object could be the Torrid Meteor Stream. This stream is the result of the fragmentation of a much larger comet some 20,000 years ago. The Earth passes through the Torrid Stream in November and June each year resulting in regular meteor showers normally consisting of microscopic dust particles. A fragmentation of the stream is thought to have occurred around 500. It is possible that a fragment could then have collided with the Earth as it passed through the beta portion of the stream early in 536, causing the atmospheric dust veil event. The relevance is crop failures for several years in a row. While the dust veil was present, it may have caused widespread starvation, leading to an increased susceptibility to disease among the remaining population. Small comets had previously been thought to be less hazardous than small asteroids, but estimates show that a small comet fragment can have a global effect. In early A.D. 536, or possibly even late 535, an eruption or eruptions ejected massive amounts of sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. The solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface reduced dramatically, and this rapidly cooled the atmosphere. Despite what the global warming nuts say, the sun seems to be the main driver of temperature and climate. The main historical aspect of the period around 536 may also be the most significant, especially to those descendants of the survivors. Who would be us today? This period coincides with a mass population decrease in Europe, in the Americas, the Middle East, and in Asia. In Europe, this is commonly known as the Justinian period, named after the Justinian plague, and is believed to be the first appearance of the Black Death in Europe. Meanwhile, in the Mayan Empire, things were looking bad. Researchers have realized that there is a 100-year gap in the civilization's productivity starting in 540, suggesting a dark age. The civilization experienced mass crop failure, which led to disease, starvation, and likely internal strife. People evacuated cities in and around present-day El Salvador. Cities that were left behind experienced a dark age, as evidenced by a gap in written records and a sudden decrease in construction in Maya city centers during the 6th century. In China, 
536 was no better. Frost and snow in July and August that killed the seedling crop, causing a major famine the following autumn. Weather was so severe that 70 to 80 percent of the people starved to death. Procopius. The sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon, during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. The sun was dark and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours, and still this light was only a feeble shadow. Michael the Syrian. If such an event happened today, and crops failed over a significant part of the globe for several consecutive years, then once again a large percentage of the world's population would face starvation. Thankfully, unlike the peoples of the worst year to be alive, we don't have to worry about not having food to last, we have my Patriot supply. And right now, you can save $200 on a three-month food kit with ADAPT 2030. ADAPT and stay prepared. And now on with the video. Because another thing that, uh, you know, talking to an archaeologist over in Verona, really very well-spoken, just incredibly knowledgeable curator there. I forget her name. But she was so nice to stick with, with me through the uh, museum, because we got there first thing, it was like 9 a.m. and nobody was there. The first person didn't pop in till 10. So we were the only two, me and my wife in the museum walking around there. So the curator is with us. The, uh, and she, you know, she took us to the Neanderthal area and then I was asking about Denisovans and she's like, we don't have any Denisovan sites here. Uh, but then they had this huge timeline on the wall and it was very clearly marked where the uh, electromagnetic excursions had happened because they had 36,000 years, uh, and then it came down, then they had 24,000 years, then they had 12,000 years, and then suddenly, you know, the Younger Dryas impact, and once I said, hey, you have the Younger Dryas demarcated here at 12,500 years, that right away she knew that I knew something. So I asked her, you know, you don't have it from 12,500 years to 8,500 years, you have zero, and she's like, yeah, we don't have anything, it's called the barren period. And I was like, oh, OK, so the barren period, like nothing, zero, not even a single artifact from 12,500 up until 8,500. And some of the most lush, verdant uh, crop areas of what you consider northern Italy now. Wine, fields, wheat, whatever, nothing, zero. And uh, suddenly around 8,500 years ago, she said that they became in, suddenly independent tribes just popped out of nowhere. And, you know, they only had written or no, sorry, they only had oral languages, which they passed down through, you know, their their traditions. And then suddenly, she says, around 7000 years ago, the Sumerians come up and pop in and start to give them written language and then start to help them with agriculture. So for 1500 years, they lived as independent tribes, for a better term, or independent peoples uh, up in northern Italy up there. And then suddenly, you uh, I, I don't know what they were doing. They don't know what they were doing either. They're just a hunter gatherers or whatever. And then the Sumerians pop in and give them all this tech, all this uh, agricultural knowledge. And within like less than a thousand years, uh, they went from full nomadic peoples into uh, massive city building that like the great change, their timelines seem to be like just strangely off as well. And then uh, the collapse periods definitely are, the 3,500 year period, the 7,000 year period, and then there's smaller collapses within that of uh, something on the 4,000 or the 400 year, and then the 2,000 year change of ages. So somewhere in there, there's a looping of overlapping collapse periods. Some are greater than others, but for sure that era, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this fort fortification building was 3,500 years old. So the you think that the fortification now what would be the reason for the fortification of this uh, part of land? I mean, obviously, you know, scavengers and invaders and people that would want to, you know, take from you, uh, you know, barbaric like people. But would this serve any other purpose other than to keep people out? Well, we don't know if the capability for electrical generation, not on hydro, but using, you know, any time, but like the pyramids sit on on top of aquifers and then, you know, uh, Widencliffe Tower with Tesla using also was on top of an aquifer. So there seems to be th something with directed water through canals. That's also an integral part of 
ethereal electricity and wireless transmission of power. Now, we don't know if there are metals encapsulated in this or what the substrate was within that that could generate. Now, maybe we're looking at a giant power station for that part of the peninsula. We just don't know. The tech is so old and the building and the earthworks are so old that what's been stripped off of there for new building materials. OK, so these people come in. They find an uninhabited city that's mainly wrecked from a reset, met floods, it could be waves, whatever. They need to rebuild. So the first thing they're going to do is they're not going to go out and manufacture bricks. They're going to strip stuff off of the hills and the fortifications that are really close to them. That's a, and this is a recurring theme, too, is a lot of stuff was stripped off of the existing earthworks to use to build the city inside. So think about the water usage. Yeah, it's a great way. OK, but what's the real purpose? Are you going to tell me you're just going to do that much work to cut off, a, a, you know, a two mile journey of of a boat going through there? They could just go around that little peninsula on that small little island like, you know, in an extra hour or two. So why would you do that much work? You know, the, the well, they're carving water canals to save on transit time. Well, dude, you're talking about an extra hour going around the tip of that thing. Well, come on, I don't believe that. Did we we had boats uh, back then. There we were uh, seafaring people, right? Or did we have we not discovered uh, boats by this point? Oh, absolutely! They're finding all kind of inland boats. That was another recurring theme too. Was because I asked the curator everywhere everywhere I went. I don't care what place I went to. I was like, are there any stories and themes of waves or wave damage or kind of really high tides for, you know, small periods that would have disrupted, you know, sea commerce or have destroyed or at least, you know, inundated the coastal areas of some cities? And the answer was yes, 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 and yes, again and again and again. And uh, there are several, more than a handful of ports that were completely abandoned across northern Italy. Now, the story goes, well, the river stopped running through, so they abandoned the port. But now these ports are like, you know, half a mile inland. And I'm like, I, I get it. If it was a water port up the Amazon, I get it if the river changes course. But this is a seaport. It really shouldn't matter that much if the river coming from a mountain somewhere changes course. You're on the sea. It really shouldn't matter too much. You know, but to, to have the excuses of, well, the, the river change course and then everything infilled. And that's why all these ports are at the uniform level of probably, you know, half a mile inland all along a line there. Like what happened to that? What pushed all that earth in there? What caused that like subsistence, perhaps, or, you know, land raising, perhaps? I mean, what, what causes that? And the old port of Rome, too, if you go down on the west side and you go from Rome directly west out to the coast, uh, you'll find some old lithographs of these giant, I mean, just like magnificently giant pre-Greek ports out there. One is a perfect octagon, but that thing's like a mile and a half inland now. But then it was from an octagon into a half moon into a larger half moon with like, you know, 100 foot tall statues standing there at the port entrance and all that's gone. And the only thing left of it now is the, uh, is the octagon. I did a full video on that one. And you can still see vestiges using Google Earth of the furthest, largest outer port rings that are underwater now, completely 100% underwater. And then uh, that middle port ring area has disappeared because they put an airport there. But the, the last little bit of the octagon is still visible. It's a lake in, in itself, and it's an archaeological. You have to buy a ticket to go in and see it. But that whole area, too, you know, that follows right along with the inundation of so you're telling me that and here, here's the thing, too, when you're looking at today's measurements, the octagon shape of that lake is still visible and you can see the causeway that connects to the center part. But then the outer rings are still underwater out in the ocean. We are talking something that was built thousands of years ago that was at least a mile deep as a port when you come in through like what we do today with our ports could rival that but you're talking 3,000 3,500 years ago when a port when you start to make the entry coming past the break wall and the causeways there that still sends you another more than a mile inland before you finally reach the uh, disembarkation point I mean that is a lot of stone and um, you know buildings and earthwork to put together you know supposedly is a you know inferior and prehistoric peoples almost is the way 
that they try to teach us in history that anything prior to, you know, 500 years ago, they were living in mud huts and kind of thing. But you go back and agree, the only they'll give it to the Greek and Romans. Yeah, they had some temples. Yeah, they had this the Temple of Jupiter, whatever. But they never talk about the port construction because it's so vast. It rivals anything we've done today. And again, these the building construction of the old of the old uh, amphitheaters or the Colosseums, excuse me. Right. It rivals if they're put at the smallest ones that were reconstructed that they, they couldn't build to the previous like girth and giantness of the of the builders of the previous reset still sat 30,000 people. That's what our coliseums and, you know, things seat today. Apparently, the large one that was built prior could seat up to 100,000 people. So that rivals any of our stadiums that we have today for playoff games. You know, you're looking at orders of magnitude larger but that's not supposed to exist in the historical past. That's the recurring theme is everything that shouldn't exist in the past exists in the past. And we never talk about it. And what's the timeline for the reset and why did it reset? That's the whole thing. Why did it reset every single time? Why are we finding we've gone from largeness to smaller, to smaller, to less, to less, you know, to more inferior, more inferior, less, uh, I guess missing a word there. It's early in the morning anyway. <laughs> no, I think I appreciate you for being here. It definitely is uh, super early. It's light where you are and it's dark where I am. Uh, but I wanted to share this uh, image because I found this image very interesting that you sent me. Uh, what's going on in, in this picture? Well, this is the coat of arms for the city of Palmanova. That star fort that you showed me, this is the coat of arms for their city. Yeah, the, the double-headed eagle at the top left is Austrian. Yeah. Originally from Austria. Now that's another thing. Anywhere that this fingerprint of the builders has gone contains an Eagle, double headed Eagle, at least in Europe. And then you pointed out rightly so that, you know, that has moved over to America with a single Eagle, but where the fingerprint of the old builders and the old knowledge remains, uh, it's a double headed Eagle. And I didn't find it everywhere. I only found it some places. So obviously, you know, it's a sign also. Well, it's interesting because the original double-headed eagle you can track back to Samer. And you said that the Sumerians uh, came to uh, to that where that star fort was located and basically gave them ag agriculture, right? So maybe they adopted this sigil as well, along with the other things that they showed them. Very interesting. And the uh, I talked to my friend uh, Paul Knight that uh, does a lot of research into Yanis. His uh, channel on YouTube is the Black Sheep Researcher, and uh, he's talking about Yanis being this uh, double-headed entity. And Yanis is like the the god of like everything. He's the god of archways. He's the gar god of uh, doorways. He's the god of keys, and he's always symbolized with two heads or three heads. And that's immediately when I looked at this image, I was like, that's Yanis right there at the top. And then how that's been carried over into the United States with the, the, the one headed uh, eagle. You now it's just really fascinating and really interesting. The, the symbolism here, and this one has a crown over its head. Hey, I don't know, it's very interesting. And then you got this chimera thing down here what is that like the body of a lion and then i was talking to you about the book of ezekiel earlier when we were discussing uh you know ezekiel seeing the being coming down from the sky the uh, i think it had five heads i believe one of an ox one of an eagle one of a lion and a, a few other animals but you got a, a lion body here here and a, a double-headed eagle i don't know what it means but it's interesting and I would say one thing, I have a new, and this came to me in a church, a cathedral of all things. So I was looking for the answers. I could just can't figure this thing out. Why is this? A... The cross that you're looking at is the galactic cross. They encoded that in the religion. So we would not forget it when we came to this new turning coming from Pisces to Aquarius. Like the best way to encode messages is into religion itself. So... I know a lot of people are going to have a difficult time, you know, with a lot of the research I'm going to be putting out. But what we're looking at, the reason the cross is there is 
this reference time of the returning of Christ and the returning of the Christ consciousness, A, they're talking about the Birkeland current and the physical change of energetic flow through our solar system that's going to bring in heightened awareness to the, the human being. And, you know, you consider Christ consciousness at a higher level, a higher vibrating, more understanding in the interwovenness uh, of all complex life and, and, and energies that exist within dimensionality, as well as how we are connected through spirit back to creator. Like we've lost that. We went through the dark ages. That is coming back again. So in the literal sense, if you're looking about an energy transmutation as we're moving through space, you know, astrology explains through those different zodiac signs that move every 2000 years. We just moved into another one, just moved into Aquarius. And it's interesting that the biblical references are all talking about the return of Christ right as we exit Pisces, which was the beginning at the birth of Christ into Aquarius right now. And that cross you're seeing there is not a crucifixion cross. That is the galactic cross that we are moving into another galactic cross and in a time of disruption ensues once again. I have a couple you know, oil paintings from the 1400s where Christ is he's not on the cross. His head is laying exactly in the center of that and it looks like the old Rosa Crucarian cross square right in the middle of the cross. So there's a lot of things that were encoded in biblical paintings because you have to realize how powerful the church was at that time. You know, they were going to burn Copernicus alive for saying that the sun was the center of our solar system. So to encode this knowledge, which was being passed down through quote unquote secret societies had to be done in a biblical contextual way. So when I'm looking at saints, they're not saints. They are the planets and they put the different configurations. It's no different than us looking at like a solar system scope model where the planets would reside in the heavens on their orbits in different times of the year. Well, all you have to do is just take the planets and turn them into saints and put them in that same rotation. And you can find, you know, different alignments, too. And when you see the halos glowing on the heads of a lot of these saints or Mary and baby Jesus and things. Mary is always depicted in this yellow clothing with the glowing, you know, aura around the head. That's the sun. And the baby Jesus, that's the sun protecting us, the earth, with the electromagnetic field. Now, it's interesting because sometimes you see Mary super glowing and the earth is not glowing and it's kind of tipped on the side like this uh, in a distressed state. But then other times, baby Jesus has a glowing halo and Mary has a glowing halo and they're holding each other and they're in symbiosis with the two magnetic fields matching. And then you can look on the outside and you can see where Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are represented by uh, the staff, which would be the planets themselves. And then also you can see the Saturnian rings very clean. Once you start to see it, you're like, oh, that's not a halo, man. Those are rings. They knew what Saturn looked like way back then. Then you start to take a whole different look at the encoding of paintings on how they were representing not only orbital flows, but the energetic electromagnetic effects between those planetary bodies and also disruptions in that that cause distress on Earth right here. And, you know, a lot of people are going to have a very difficult time and very big problem that are super dogmatic about the decoding of these paintings, because that, in my opinion, is the only way you could have hidden this information is in plain sight. That's the only way it could be done. And it had to be done under the guise and the rules of the church. So everything had to be in a biblical text. So how would you disguise it? But it's all there for once you start to see it, you can't unsee it. It's very difficult to unsee once you see it. Well, this double headed eagle right here uh, has the um, crown on the top of Well, is that do they have crowns on top of their heads and then one big crown over top of them? I mean, that could be depicted as the corona of the sun as well. And the yeah. crown of thorns on Jesus can be depicted as the corona around the sun. Halo can be depicted as the corona around the sun. You know, it's sun god worship. Yeah, That's what about what? the filaments coming off the sun? If you had, you know, a, a highly electrified state and you had like, you know, 20, 30 filaments coming off the sun that were visible from our planet, then that would be the crown of thorns, would it not? 